I have 624 individual cards, 74% of all Super Nintendo USA releases. There's also some obscure peripherals. 11, 12, 13, 14. One of the things I always like to get was ridiculous and crazy controllers. Yeah, this looks like Harvest Moon. Six Space Invaders games. Super Noah's Ark 3D. These are super collectible nowadays. I think it's like a game G. Jun SNES, Jun SNES. Jun SNES. Craigie, we've come to the end of my collection. And today we're gonna to take a look at player's guides and books, and then we're gonna take a look at your comments and feedback. Won't that be fun? I think so. I would always try to get the original player's guides with my games. Sometimes they'd add it on, oh, do you want it for 10 extra bucks, you can get a player's guide. The Nintendo first party ones are excellent. The one notable one that's missing from this little collection here is the Link to the Past Player's Guide, which is a great book. The first one that I really like here, which is the Mario Paint Guide. I think this is a critical piece to have along with Mario Paint. It gives you so many ideas of cool things you can make with it. Not only is it giving you some amazing examples of what you can do in Mario Paint, it's giving you a little art history lesson. We've got the 1900 to 1940s, a Picasso work here. Crying Woman, a Kandesky, Dolly's famous melting clocks, probably professionally done by Nintendo staff artists. Got a recreation of a little bit of Disney down here. Album covers recreated in Mario Paint. So impressive. It's, yeah. This is the Star Spangled Banner. You're getting educated about the essentials of animation, about music. And Mario Paint's really stood the test of time. I mean, to this day, people create incredible things like yep. Bohemian Rhapsody on Mario Paint. Somebody actually made a program that lets you write music like Mario Paint, but with more sounds and with sharps and flats, which Mario Paint couldn't do. My favorite one I've ever seen online was the Mario Paint version of Africa by Toto. Yeah, it's pretty fun. Stamps that you can use to make Mario World animation. You'd have to draw them in by hand, and I definitely did this. I remember my friend Gary and I sitting in his basement with this book, programming them into Mario. And by programming, you mean like you just you pixel by them. pixel. You, you pixel by pixel draw them in. Homestar Runner was started on Mario Paint. I feel like the notion of make your own in Nintendo games really went away after Mario Paint and kind of came back with Mario Maker. Yeah, it is like the spiritual successor. Yeah, Paper Mario is to Mario RPG as Mario Maker is to Mario Paint. Yeah. Original character work here. The mother cleaning up the house and looking displeased that the son's just sitting there watching TV. Street Fighter 2 graphics, so you can make your own kind of battles and stuff. A ton of songs that you can put in, the Nutcracker Suite. As a musician yourself, did you ever uh, compose anything Absolutely. Original? The capabilities were kind of limited. The length is fairly short. This is the length you got, basically. And no sharps, no flats. You just changed the key of the song into a key yeah. that had no flats, no sharps, usually C. Which made everything sound pretty Mario the same. Yeah, Mario Painty, but still. And then at the end, there's a gallery of art. Stevie's Wonders, this is, uh, you know, Steven wow, Spielberg's yeah. If Nintendo ever had, like, a museum to itself, it should include, like, one room of just Mario Paint art. Oh, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> okay, so that's probably one of my favorite ones. This is the Super Game Boy Guide. And what they did in this book was give you an introduction to what the capabilities of the Super Game Boy were, and then options in terms of what you had for color palettes. So you could customize the color palettes that were used for monochrome games, just kind of encouraging you it's kind of selling you games. Now that you have your Super Game Boy, you may want to consider all of these awesome games. Kind of a reintroduction to the Game Boy, maybe. Yeah, Link's Awakening with the different palettes and showing you how it could look. This one, we've already covered it briefly, but I just want to talk on it one more time. It's just filled with the most amazing graphic art, amazing facts about the games. Look at this double fold-out, which is just incredible. I bought that for $10 at a retro game shop. Yeah, these don't actually go for all that much. Yeah. They are mildly collectible. The next one I have here is Donkey Kong Country one. This one is one of the thinner ones, and this also wasn't a first party game, so it didn't get the same kind of attention, but it still gives you a complete guide of who all the characters are. Kind of acts basically like an extended manual. But you can definitely see that the material is a lot thinner. This is much cheaper paper. This is how these players guys sadly ended up in the end. Brittle and it's starting to age poorly because of the acid. You know, you have your standard level guides in here. Yeah. I love them putting all the different screens together. So I just at a glance, you can see the whole level. Secrets and tips. That's what they really got to sell you. You know, oh, do you want to know what to do here? I think it wasn't until the N64 that they started mailing Nintendo Power subscribers uh, VHS promos. Mm -hmm. Keith and I got a Star Fox one and a Diddy Kong Racing one yeah. in the mail, oh, and we would quote them all the time, as, as, <laughs> as if it was like real entertainment. Pizza for Bob. Yeah. You uh, Bob. Yeah, but I didn't order any pizza. Pizza for Bob. Are you uh, 
kebab? Yeah, but uh, I didn't order any pizza. When you're young, a video game advertisement is just another opportunity to consume more video game media. Exactly. It's like being excited to see the new Apple showcase. Or E3 next week. Or E3, <laughs> yeah. or even a movie trailer. It's just like, that. that's an ad. Next up, we have the Yoshi's Island Player's Guide. This is really focused in on the game, divided into categories. You know, bonus challenges, bonus games, bosses. There's still some nice art that's kind of reflective of the game, but not really super aligned with the visual style, like this brick element in here. The game was never that visually rough. It was always right. much softer. They're a way of extending the life of the game in some respect. Yeah. It's a way to like relate to the game when you're in the car or when you're exactly. on, the, on the bus. Oh, I definitely did that. I actually had one of these for Super Mario 3. I just realized that I used to have this. This one, this one right here, as soon as I saw this, I just got <laughs> hit with a whoa. So the next one I want to take a look at, really what they are is just advertisements for other Super Nintendo games. As of the time this one was published, which was 1992, it goes through all games that were released and talks about them and gives you kind of an a in-depth advertisement for them. And then it also talks about future games that are gonna come. Palettes, comparing the NES to the Super Nintendo, what they can do in terms of color layering, giving you all the technical details. Suddenly they start slagging off their old system. Yeah, yeah, well, this is the new thing, the yeah. old one. You we know. already sold you a few million of those. Exactly. <laughs> it has these images that have really nothing to do with games, and then they kind of link them into games that barely make sense. Like, they say map moves, and they talk about wrestling, and then they link to Final Fight, which really didn't have much wrestling at all. It was a, a shoot-em-up game. So this is a pretty specious link. But then they spend a couple pages on each game, you know, giving you a mini guide for that game, which is pretty cool. So if you have a couple of these games, especially if you had a couple in 1992, this book kind of made sense because it gives you a few tips for the area. All of these connect you closer to the brand. They yep. make you more of a Nintendo loyalist. Instead of being somebody who just happens to like Chrono Trigger or happens to like Super Mario World, this makes you a Nintendo fan. Yes. Nintendo so, Power was especially effective at that. Yep. Your book here is part of a two volume set called the SNES Omnibus. Yeah. And it's an incredible set of books that talks about every single US game on the system. Gives you a little overview, gives you guides when it was released, who the publisher was, excellent information. Very well researched too. A lot better information in this book than there is on Wikipedia certainly. I really love the summaries in this. This was a fairly expensive book, right? Yeah, it was like $50 at least. Yeah, so you're talking for the two volume set, that's a hundred bucks, but if you want to know about a game, it really gives you that and really gives you a little bit of the experience. Not really a guidebook per se. I think this is a really awesome book set. I would love to have this in my collection. Boogerman. Boogerman. On the very back, they got some titles. Oh, yeah. Oh, nice. Excellent games here. Just a beautiful book. Now, this is the Nintendo version of that book, the Super NES Game Guide. Oddly, not a lot of graphic design on the cover. <laughs> I guess they were trying to keep with the style of the Super Nintendo packaging and box. This is 1993. This aims to cover every game at that time. So it's kind of like this player's guide, upgraded, but the game summaries get much smaller because they got a lot more to cover. You basically just get a half page for each game. They have these little boxes on the side which give you the size of the game in megabits. I don't know why everybody cared about that, but it was definitely a key marketing element, like eight megabit game, which is one megabyte, by the way. If it was a save game or a password game, which is actually kind of useful to know when it came out. And then they have these power meter ratings, graphics, play control, challenge, theme, and fun. And the ratings are very inflated. Like even the worst game, this game, uh, Arrow the Acrobat has notoriously awful controls and they have given it a 2.9 out of five. This was really just more of an extended advertisement. Like, this is like a catalog, kind of. It kind of resembles like the Sears wish list for how, It, it you know. absolutely does. Yeah. You're really just getting a summary of the game to see, oh, I might like that. And it's divided by category, so it really is just like a catalog saying, Mom, I want Super Caesar's Palace. No, you don't. Still, uh, it's kind of an interesting piece of, of Nintendoology, you know? The last thing that I want to take a look at in terms of books is the third party books. And there are tons of these. I have one Brady Games Guide. They made tons of these for many different games. This one is super secret codes for a Super Nintendo. It's a cheap mass market, black and white print. And you look up the game and they give you either password codes for Adventures of Batman and Robin here. This is the sequence you enter to get to various stages. And also I was just reading in here about a Super Mario Kart trick that I had no idea about where you can access 
special cups before you've beaten the previous ones by using a certain controller sequence. Wow. Did yeah. you buy it at a Scholastic book fair? Because this is the type of book I would expect to see. Absolutely. It's not allowed. Your parents? My parents would not. Video not a real book. Were... I mean, we used to have sustained silent reading in the mornings. Yeah. And we would always try to get away with reading Nintendo Power or Game Informer or something like that. And they would often be like, that's not what we're talking about. Yeah, <laughs> that's not what we're trying to get you to read. Little women. Yeah, little women. <laughs> All the girls right. in the class were looking at us like, we understand what to do. <laughs> this book is about horses. Here's one more. An off-brand just written by two guys. Yoshi's Island Player's Guide. Compare and contrast it with the Nintendo one. It's several steps down. It's monochrome. Wow, it really sucks the joy out of Yoshi's Island. It certainly it does. does. I guess it gives you some sense of what a Yoshi's Island on the Game Boy might feel like. Yeah. yeah. Which it, it makes it, me it, think, ooh, that'd be cool if this came yeah. out on the Game Boy. Give but. me one of them. They've obviously taken photos of a TV. Uh, and they're not very sharp. Nintendo ones were almost certainly computer exports, which at the time was quite a complicated process. There's no big expansive maps. It's just individual screenshots from the level showing you points of interest. So that's the books. Yeah, that's my collection of books. That's something I'd still expand because they're still really cheap. And they don't take um, up a lot of space. And they don't take up a lot of space. So with being the last episode, I wanted to make sure that we were answering any questions or responding to any comments that we thought were interesting. Sure. Kevin Smith, our fan Kevin Smith, yep. not, not the celebrity, but the guy, he said, stoked for this, also Chrono Trigger is the best game of all time. Uh, ah. Kevin Smith is correct. Scott3j3 said, I cannot wait to binge all these episodes. I think one thing that is cool about finishing a series yeah. is that you really can, beginning to end, yeah. binge some. It, it's a fixed thing. Furlix Jerlobi says, oh man, I know the feeling of having a partially finished RPG maker game. Too many ideas, not enough wherewithal to implement them. Exactly. That's, that's exactly the problem. <laughs> Ashley says, yay, please talk about the Lion King game at some point. That was a major part of my childhood. The Lion King was actually a huge part of my childhood too. It was gifted to my sister and I in a really dry period of SNES games before I had many RPGs at all. And it actually has very nice graphics and pretty good yeah. sound. I don't like the it way is, Simba controls. No, it controls like mud. I don't think I ever beat it, but I did get to the last level, certainly. I had a couple of Disney games. There was the Aladdin game, first of all. I gotta say, the Genesis version of the Aladdin yeah, game is far wins. superior than SNES. I also, on the Genesis, Beauty and the Beast was an interesting marketing challenge for Disney because they didn't know if they should market to girls or boys. Yep. And so they just decided to make one game for boys and one game for girls. So they made War of the Beast for boys, and that's what I owned. Yep. And that also controlled like ass because you were a giant beast that could barely jump. And then they made like, you know, I think it was called like Belle's Adventure or something. This is for Genesis. Right? Yeah. yeah. I don't think they, there is any uh, yeah. SNES Beauty and the Beast game. Nick XL says, it says RGSS102E.DLL could not be found. RPG Maker hasn't changed a bit, I see. He tried to install your game and couldn't. <laughs> yes, there is, there's like three steps you need to do. You need to install the RMXP runtime package, the RTP. Then you need to install the font package, which I think I gave you. And then you need to install the game. You have to do all three steps in that order for it to work. I think some versions of RPG Maker had an expo option that would package all that stuff together. They so totally that... did, but I never got far enough in the development that I did that ever. Okay. On our rifle episode, uh, Parallax says, I've never fired a real gun before. It was painfully obvious. I get where you're coming from. Like, of course, we don't know how to hold guns. I actually, there's another clip on YouTube of someone actually shooting one correctly and totally hitting all the targets and it working just fine. Yeah, I think if we worked on it for a while, we could get better at it and maybe hit a target. If you were, had been here to help me, yeah. since I'm new, I would have taken your lessons, but exactly. in the meanwhile, I just we, gotta be cringy and... <laughs> we did the best we could with, with the skill set that we have. Which was zero. Bort Simpson pointed out, poor Frankie, right-handed, but left eye dominant. And I never even really knew what that meant. Yeah, I'm right hand, right eye. So they suggested that maybe I shoot with my left hand. We also pronounced Jaeger as Jagger, as Big Zeke points out. Again, Anyone like minimally involved in the gun world would absolutely know that, and I would not at all. On the uh, Crazy Controllers episode, yes. Tempest Fury said the craziest controller has to be the ASCII keyboard controller for the GameCube. I have one. It looks like a wave bird, but there's a keyboard in the middle. Yeah, keyboard. it is wacky. That's very wacky. Ango Tango Fox says, have you seen the HD Mode 7 mod? It was discovered just a week or so ago, and it makes all of the Mode 7 games like Mario Kart and F-Zero look amazing. Mode 7, of course, just makes use of very large images that are warped in some way and then filtered through the original resolution of the NES. So in changing the filtering resolution, they got it so that you can see the full detail of the texture with all the other sprites unchanged. And they look incredible. It's a really smart optimization. We could have done this years ago. This is not like some new technology enabled this. I remember playing PlayStation 1 emulators, and they would up-res everything. Mm -hmm and it would look great, and it's the same idea. 
the assets that are stored were higher resolution so that when you were zoomed in, they looked good. Uh, but then when you zoomed out, they took on a low resolution property because they had to just do the calculations quickly. You improve those calculations, it looks great. I highly recommend you try that out if you're a fan of Mode 7 stuff. Daniel Rourke pointed out, yep, I just came here to break you all for never playing a Bomberman game. Like, what the hell did you do with your SNES? It's insane. What other classics have you never played? I played pretty standard games like Tetris Attack and Tetris and RPGs and maybe a platformer or two. I personally didn't have a Super Nintendo when I was a kid. I was a Sega guy. And so I've gotten exposed to things I'd never seen before. Yeah. Uh, you and I, for a little while, while we were just hanging out at the studio, we played yeah. Zombies Ate My Neighbors. I yeah, never played so that. Kind of fun. I thought it was really fun. People were mad in general, this is a general note, that John is hoarding both Mario Paints and SNES consoles. <laughs> Look. Buy there them yourself. There are more than a million Super Nintendos and more than a million copies of Mario Paint because Mario Paint is one of the million seller games. That means that I have like 23 over a million. If you want to be mad about something, be mad about the fact that I have nine of the 275 copies of Fun and Games. Yeah. Every time I see one, I buy one because they're very rare. They didn't make very many at all. Not valuable, but rare. Yes, exactly. You a should collect the them all. On the episode where we were looking at the tech manual and the testers, Music Bookaholic says, certain people will burn in headphones. They will run them at full volume for days at a time. That's right. And I have done that with speakers before. Not running them at full volume, but running them for like a good six hours with a loud bass sound playing or a noise sound playing to kind of break them in. And they say it changes the sound. I could never hear any difference. And your neighbors feel good about this? <laughs> <laughs> maybe they do, maybe they don't. I don't know. And then final comment that I have here, SqueeTube said, does John have one of those devices that allows you to load SNES ROMs from three and a half inch floppy disks? I do. Always stuck out as the most out there unofficial SNES peripheral. So I have two of them and I have one right here. This is not actually the latest generation. This is generation seven. This is called Super UFO. It has a three and a half inch Sony floppy drive up here, has a cartridge connector up here, and then it fits into the bottom of a Super Nintendo. And then it has a memory card that goes in the bottom here that allows you to basically load the game from the floppy disk into RAM and then run it as if it were the game. It also has uh, a parallel port on the back so that you could download saves out of the system if you wanted to back them up. If you just had ROMs, you could feed the ROM in and not have to do the cartridge and then transfer it to disk. None of them can emulate the special chips though. However, if you plugged in a game with that special chip, for some chips, it could pass the chip through. Didn't work for anything advanced like the SA-1, but it was your only way to kind of pirate games at that time. I know one game was at least eight megabits. Yes. Translating to roughly eight megabytes, uh, would that be able to fit on the 1.4 megabyte floppy? You broke it up into two okay. uh, or, or three. Okay. The maximum capability of this particular unit is 24 megabit, three megabyte. I don't think it could do Final Fantasy VI, for example. I think that's a four megabyte game. I used to have right next to this little array of floppy disks with the games labeled disk one, disk two, disk three, disk four. Well, I mean, that, that pretty much sums up the collection. Pretty much. There's some little things hanging around that we didn't really cover, but you've seen the best parts of my collection, the, the parts that I really wanted to show and present to you. People are welcome to go to the Red Cow Reddit and talk to us more about video games and SNES there. Yep. Some people have asked that we do uh, live streams in the future where we play games. That sounds like a ton of fun. But, but the formal show is over. Yeah, it's coming to an end. But there's one, there's one last thing to do. What's that? I, I want to see if we can get one shot off in that stupid rifle game. All right. <laughs> Let's get it out. All right, first we're gonna try Yoshi Safari to see whether or not this thing works with any other Super Scope games. Is this, is this holding it better? Internet? I mean, it's just a controller, isn't it? Yeah, but I don't think it's the same at all in terms of no. uh, what it did, so. All right. No dice there. No dice. That's it, your answer to that question. The key thing that I heard was stand further away. So, by the way, I did submit a Freedom of Information Act request to get more information about the contract related to this game. And a very nice gentleman from Georgia called me and informed me that contracts from 19. 92, 93 are not yet digitized. He said they would keep looking, but it's unlikely they would find anything because the amount of effort needed to search manually through the documents is extreme. Here we go, cringy Fran. They're right about, it feels better for me to shoot with my left. Aim at the blue cross and pull the trigger. Already I can aim it's it It's already so much nicer, at least it appears to be. Yep, it totally is. Press start to begin. Yeah, no wind or anything. Remember this? Yeah, yeah I do. You were off the screen. When the red border comes on, you're off the screen. Can you point the TV at me more centrally? Yeah. Prepare to fire. How is that off the screen?
You probably calibrated it wrong now that the television is. Did you oh, yeah. calibrate again? Let's calibrate again. Oh, yeah, it's different. It's a lot different. I wish there was a crosshair on the actual game. Invalid shot group. <laughs> Did anybody else like to try? Have you ever tried it? I don't think I've tried it before. I'm going to cal calibrate for you, EJ, okay? So that feels pretty in control, right? Invalid shot group. <laughs> so the answer is we still cannot do it. So we end John Snath's How We Began It. Invalid, invalid shot, shot group. group. <laughs> I want to thank Keith for being an awesome co-host. You've been a great contributor. Thanks. It was a lot of fun. We want to thank EJ for the beautiful camera work, yes. which a lot of you have also commented on how yep. great that was. Zach and Matt for uh, helping to set up the set and lug everything in here. We hope that you continue binging the show for uh, a long, long time. That it acts as yes. a snapshot of this collection and of that era of Super Nintendo. Indeed. Indeed.